Play the game, Sam. Breakdown is brought to you by Neurofen Duralast. Available every day at Chemist Warehouse. And a very warm welcome to The Breakdown. I am Laura McGoldrick filling in again for Kirsty, who's enjoying Coachella, as she should. We wish we were there too. Uh, great to be back with you tonight. Joined on the panel by Sir John Kerr and Joey Wheeler and making her debut on the show, yeah. Christina yes. Sue, former Blackburn. Hello, Ooh. my love. Great to have you with us. Now, happy Easter to all of you at home. And I did make some promises uh, last week, so I, I have come good. And just look, I need to get this out of the way early. Um, JK, because you won, I thought, and you know that's tough for me to admit as a Crusaders gal, but I thought you can have the big egg. Oh, should I throw it? Here's a big egg. Let's be honest. Oh, that is beautiful. Um, Thank you. Egg. Look at that. Look at that. You oh. enjoy that. Um, and Christina, uh, this is as a triple international. You get a kiwi. It's only oh. fitting for you. You can pass that down, Joey. I don't want to throw the kiwi. Yum, yum, yum. And um, Joey, tough, tough, <laughs> tough, really tough, <laughs> yeah. tough game yeah. for you. So there's your Easter egg. Happy Easter. <laughs> That's a bit like the season. Is that because of my waistline? Like the season. No, it's your season. My it's oh, definitely season. just reflecting yeah. the Highlander season. Promising. So. I like to call this promising. <laughs> like a check, like a, like whatever sort of a, a bird will come out of this, it's promise. Are you, 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 still think one promise. you still think you've got a chance? <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Mathematical and liter quite literally. I love when it's already coming down to I've got a mathematical chance. I really do. <laughs> let's take a look back at the weekend, the games that will. Let's get into our debrief of the weekend. Super Rugby with your event available at Chemist Warehouse now. JK, um, look, <laughs> we talked about it at length last week and... It's one of those games where everyone talks about it. There's all this <laughs> hype and and it lived up to it. And it doesn't always. Oh, 2004 people. A long <laughs> way. Uh, look, for Bill Beaumont said last year that when our game is played in the right spirit, I believe when you've got a positive referee, it is a great game. And it was that the other night. The Crusaders were outstanding. The Blues were very, very good. But they were positive. Christina, they were positive. Everyone was positive. Had everything. Drama. Drama. And cards. the Blues won. <laughs> OK, well, we don't have to keep saying that, but because you don't want to, you know, as a Crusaders aren't going to waste a win on a pool game, they'll just win in the final. That'll be fine. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> but <laughs> when you look at the intensity, players and coaches all talked about having test match intensity at times. And as fans watching it, you could see that, JK. Yeah, and... and from from the first whistle, it was just intense, Joey. Oh, you the know? intent from both teams, wasn't it? Like, it had everything. Brutality. You talk about the drama, uh, but uh, the brutality in this game was... The hits were just savage, and that's what we're talk they were talking about, alluding to in terms of the test match-like intensity. The, the brutality of the contacts was just huge. But the speed in which this game was played at, Christina, it was brilliant. It had everything. Razzle-dazzle, like... Teams were showing intent from their own their own halves, which we hadn't seen, because I thought it might be a bit of a bash fest. These two forward packs rolling their sleeves up and going, yeah, we're going to go dong dong, but they were throwing it round. It was awesome. Just a great spectacle. Yeah, I agree. It was a great spectacle. I think the discipline, uh, Blues were able to handle that um, from their end, and obviously on the other side, we had the Crusaders with a couple of cards there, and, um, and actually it was entertaining rugby, and you had the players that we expected to have in, uh, play um, informed rugby did so, the likes of Bowdoin Barrett and Papa Lee. How good was he in the weekend? Unbelievable. He to, was win, absolutely to, to win, you've got to have your key players standing Sorry. up under pressure, and if one thing the Crusaders have shown us over the years, it has been that. And I think that was the difference. I mean, Rico Ioane's tackle, um, Bowden Barrett, I thought was outstanding. And you need that to win those games. I mean, there is a reason why we haven't won down there since 2004. It's because the Crusaders are so good. And, you know, like you said, Thank you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed because they'll get, they'll be stinging from that. Do you that. think that's the better. influence of Leon, right? So the him taking that that crusader mindset of they they did a crusaders 
to, to the Crusaders in many respects. Like, normally you see the Crusaders that 10 minutes before halftime, that 10 minutes after, that's when they dominate teams and they just strangle them. Mate, I'm pretty sure Leon was born in Auckland. He's just... <laughs> he is Marlborough. He's now playing out. Right? I don't even claim that. Marlborough. I think we'll have to look into that to be... He's Marlborough. playing out. Marlborough. Look, I think... Oh, God, look at We've got to claim that. He's Marlborough, please. Please, please. I think you need to... I mean, I said I've got a bit of a bromance with the man because he's done what a lot of us couldn't do. Um, but, you know, you have to start talking about him with Razor as the future of the All Black coaching staff. I mean, he has done pretty much, like I said, what a lot of us haven't been able to do. He's created a, you know, a really strong team. I mean, the defence against the Chief the week before is how they set up this, because we saw them on attack, because that's the film that I wanted, um, you know, the, the defence was outstanding at times, getting off their own line, really making, because off a tongue and a fussy, I'm going to cut his head open just a oh. week before, because I thought he can't be playing with 48 stitches in his knob. He oh. was outstanding. It's the first time I've actually seen him going into contact. Oh, I just, lo I love that. Look at that. Go, Rico. You but the good excitement thing. in the box, right, Leon? Yeah. That was the most Yeah, but that moment, you know, that, that moment. Huge. And I want to talk about Rico because people say, oh, he's a bit quiet. But actually, what he's done is he is playing as a sound defensive centre. He's improved that. They've asked him to improve. And he does one or two great things a game. And that was a key moment. I thought he was in for all money in the corner. And they got across. Him and Dalton Popoli were outstanding. Mm. One of the players we talked about um, was former Crusader, Luke Romano, and you saw how much it meant to him in the, in the final moment when that whistle blew. Winning, winning breeds winning, right? So he, he's come from a winning culture to, to a team that's not winning as much, and now all of a sudden they're winning again and they're learning how to win. How crucial do you th think he has been to the Blues campaign this oh, season, Joe? Oh, massively, without a doubt. That guy, oldest statesman in that, in that pack, would bring a hell of a lot of belief to that pack because... Oh, JK, we were on a game earlier and I, and I always question, teams have always talked about the Blues' soft underbelly when in those moments, those big moments in games, generally they found a way to lose games, not win games. With the belief that he's brought into that team, he has transformed that, he's transformed mindsets and that young Blues forward pack, they are so young, but they have invested in these guys. They've invested in them a few years ago. They've spent the cash on some big name players, Bowden Barrett, namely, Roger Tuivasa-Sheck, and probably Luke Romano, somehow getting him out of a Crusader stronghold. They don't, they don't give up their players easily, especially an experienced campaigner like that. Uh, he has done wonders to that forward pack and, without a doubt, a, a really, really key signing. And, and it can't be understated, his influence on that team. Absolutely not. But, Christina, how do you think the Blues now take this and carry on that momentum, keep winning? Oh, it's about that consistency to perform, right? They've got Fiji Druin um, going into the Super Round and no doubt they'll bring that level of physicality. And, and for Blues to be consistent, uh, for Blues to perform at the back end, they need consistency. And I think that's going to be the key moving forward. It was you that said we had a soft yeah. underbelly, Joey. You don't blame anyone else, no, mate. I, you no, said. I, said, I said it to you yeah, in you that pregame. But when you think it's about... It's been questioned. No, you've got Teams a good point. It. You've got a good point. But I think it's a really... So, from what I heard, this is Voce di Corridoio, so we don't know if it's whispers in the corridor, that, you know, Luke wasn't picked up by the Crusaders and he still wanted to keep playing, so he was disappointed. The Blues reached out through Leon because they probably know each other really well. But when you look at that forward pack, they're young. You know, Dalton Popoli is 23. Um, Hoskins Satutu is 22, you know. Um, they are a young pack. And so he has brought a yeah, bit of this, bit of confidence. You've got to give Leon some credit for that. The foresight they, to invest in those young guys, yeah, it took some hurt for a few years to get them to this point. But now they're starting to recognise the benefits of investing in some young talent a few years ago, developing them, giving a guy like Dalton some leadership. Mm. And we've seen the growth in his game through you know, the ability to lead this team, he, his game's gone to a whole nother level. And uh, you, you can't understate the influence of Leon on, on that young group. And, and I suppose, yeah, just the responsibility they're taking and the care that they have for, um, you know, this sort of stuff. Five guys getting back to save a try. You, you wouldn't have seen that. And we talked about this in the green room um, earlier, didn't we, JK, that a few years ago, Rico Iwano probably wouldn't have even um, attempted to get out and make that tackle if we're being brutally honest. But, man, the change of mindset in those guys is just impressive, and, and they are a real threat. Genuine, genuine titled contenders. If you go down to Christchurch and put on a display like that, unbelievable.
Dalton didn't miss a tackle all night. Is that something that you take into the changing room and go, fellas, um, do you want to look at the numbers? Uh, it looks pretty good. Christina, what do you reckon? Oh, he's phenomenal. I think he's outstanding the form that season. You talked about Rico saving that tackle, but who was in that picture? It was also Dalton. He set up a try, um, he scored a try. Um, just his efforts around the paddock, you talked about his leadership. Um, he's certainly in form. And to be that young and to be leading a side like the Blues, I mean, the future's bright for them. It is, it is hugely bright. So let that, uh, let's take a look at the at the table uh, and you'll see that, <laughs> OK, it was tough for me. The Crusaders tucked in at four there and the Blues. JK, they look um, <clears throat> they look all right. I've Just worn my blue screen, for you people. today. <laughs> freeze your screen at home. Take a photo. <laughs> we don't that. know how long this will last. Take yeah, it's a on photo. My desktop. <laughs> it's on my desktop already. That. <laughs> That's there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, it's fascinating for me because um, I just don't know where our Aussie cousins stand. You know, so when I look at the Brumbies and the Reds, and no disrespect um, to you over there, I just don't know the comparison. So I don't know what the next month looks like, and that's what makes it exciting. Uh, Joey, your, your team will just be itching to get over to Australia, well, I imagine. Well, um, the Highlanders still... just, oh, they're quite far down there. Is that the second page, is it? Oh, no. Look, this egg is going to turn into a big egg. Okay? Small egg, small Holland, numbers. Highlanders fans, trust me, trust me, this little bad boy is going to grow. <laughs> and they are growing. Oh, are you certain? No, Joey. Mathematically, on your mathematically own time, look, man. there's... Yeah, the, the Highlanders, there are some worries there, and I think their attack is the biggest worry. Like their forward pack works their heart out, but there's just there's not much punch anywhere else, which is which is worrying. Christina, Hurricanes <laughs> territory for you. You'll be feeling pretty good. You'll know that that was definitely, absolutely, without a doubt, not a try at the end of the game uh, oh. last night. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't a try, and the Hurricanes I mean that. Lucky to get that that win, but it doesn't get easier for the Hurricanes either, does it? They they go over the ditch and they play the Reds, who are what second on the table. So, uh, for me, about the Hurricanes, they've just that inconsistent form. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, Hurricanes still can stay up there with your Landers. Yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully. Chris Christine, I think uh, <laughs> I think yeah, I think you make an interesting point because when you look at the Hurricane sides of the past and the big sides, the Conrad Smith, the Martin Onus, um, you know, Rodney Soalo, like. They were inconsistent, weren't they? As a team, they'd play outstanding for 15 minutes, and then and the Hurricanes seem to be dropping into that, and also during the 80 minutes. Do you think, or? Oh well, I think it could be to do also with the selection. Like um, they rotated five different midfielders at 12. You know, we see Jordan Barrett was in there for two of the games, but I think the selection in general has been questionable for the Hurricanes. And if you're trying to develop consistency in a performance, surely you need to have some consistent guys lining up each week. Mm -hmm. Joey, I imagine you have some thoughts and feelings about how the match ended. Um, I know you were there, you looked <coughs> particularly downtrodden, and you didn't even have your egg then, so I, that's probably why. But um, <laughs> what do you think? Um, oh, look, uh, I, 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 as, you know, the one I um, and, the Highland, and an ex-Highlander, I thought it was a try. Uh, I, I genuinely thought he had got the ball down, the foot, it had landed on the foot, and then he got the point down. The thing that worried me, though, about this situation was actually the lead-up to how there wasn't an advantage. One, firstly, there was a there was a penalty earlier where a Safo Moa, uh, Gareth Evans was blowing up about a shoulder to the head at a ruck, which was on about the 40 metre mark. That's um, sort of pretty much bread and butter for Mitch Hunt to, to kick a goal to win the game. Then there was the break by Scott Gregory down that left hand touch, and I think it was Julian Savier came from behind the ruck and basically tried to kill the ball at the ruck time, no advantage. Then there was the big carry from Solar Mal. Geordie Barrett, I believe, uh, a slightly high shot on Solar as he was diving for the line, no advantage there. So there were three moments leading up to that where I thought there could have been penalties that would have let the Highlanders potentially win the game if uh, Mitch Hunt had obviously kicked the goal. but. That was my belief. And I thought he still scored the try, obviously. Yeah, are you sure it wasn't double movement? OK, cool. No um, movement. No, um, so Joey is unhappy. <laughs> Highlanders, <laughs> captain Aaron <laughs> Highlanders captain Aaron Smith also unhappy. Here's what he had to say post-match. Oh, you know, we're getting robbed all the time. And, you know, we had a red card for a contact to the head and one of our guys blatantly gets a black eye and touches and refs just walk it off like it's nothing. So all we want is consistency as players. and. We're just getting no rub of the green at the moment, and yeah, it's pretty, it's hard to swallow. Now, if you thought that sounded familiar, here is Hurricanes captain Adi Savia post match last week. He's taking me in the air. Um, you know, as a leader, I like to put pressure on and demand, you know, from the officials and 
and making sure they're doing everything they can to get uh, to keep these calls right. Because uh, at the end of the day, it can come to either or, and we get an apology the next week, but it's too late. So um, without saying anything disrespectful, just would love to have the officials, you know, demand better. Demanding better, demanding consistency. JK, is it just too easy to blame the refs or are they in the right, these captains? Um, no, well, Angus Maybe um, had his debut. That's his last name, Angus Maybe. Um, and, you know, I thought he refed well. What Joe was saying happens every week. So it's not actually the referees, I don't believe. It's the law. And also, and also for me, um, if they were saying that about coaches, what would the world be doing? Right? So we've got senior players coming out and saying, we want to look at this. So I think the leaders of the referees, and I'll say this all the time, we need to look at our high performance pathway and see if we can help the referees do a better job. If we come back and it's too many rules, um, you know, because they've got 18 instantaneous decisions, right? And it's easy when you're sitting at, you know, on the couch like I was um, watching it on Sky, which is a great way to watch it. But when you're out there in the middle, these guys are hitting each other at all sorts of speeds. So I think there is a fundamental issue with our game. We can't, you know, Angus has gone upstairs, he's done everything right, the TMO's made a couple of decisions for him, and things in every single game go, don't go yeah. your way. And so, for me, it's invest more in the referees, yeah. have a look at the rules, and let's see. But we've got to listen to our senior players. They are starting, for the first time ever, to say, this is unacceptable. So what happened to Glenn Moore? What happened with the Black Ferns? You know, they spoke up and things happened. Right? So you, so you think we're at boiling point now? Yeah, you know, I think there has been some initiative from the referees. Like they've been putting these, uh, what the contracted referees, in the environments of these Super Rugby teams, so that the Super Rugby teams understand the rules better and how they're going to referee the game. Where I think you're alluding to, J.K., is around feedback from those referees, which they're probably so time poor. They've got maybe five games that they've got to get through every decision to give feedback back to one, the coaches, <clears throat> and two, the referee of that game. I just think they're under-resourced in that area. Like, Lyndon Bray said to me when he used to be, who's now the CEO of Tasman Rugby, he's saying he's got to go through, as the head of the referees, got to go through maybe five games and look at every decision. Man, he won't get that done till when? Till Friday. Did you waste good chocolate <laughs> on this, JK? Invest in no, no, guys no, to give no, those well, guys Joey, the I totally, to totally, totally disagree with you. That is a waste of resource. It's a waste of time. Well, how are they going to get better then, JK? They, they do it pre-mate. Like, okay. them looking at games afterwards, five games to give feedback to coaches and all stuff, the damage has been done. We've got to invest pre. Off-season, yeah. pre-season, look at games, look at situations, well, that's what look they've at done the law. with that, being in, in involved the, the uh, Super Rugby environment. So they've been in the environment, seeing all pre-season what these guys have been doing. But, yeah, they're still getting these massive moments wrong. And I think the TMO's got to take some responsibility for that. Like, go back and look at those two instances. Did they get that wrong? Yes, they missed that. Did Angus they get that, that wrong? That, no, Angus didn't. Angus went upstairs looking at the double movement. But why not look at the... You saw the, uh, the swinging arm before that and then look at the ruck as well. Because that's, that's the game on the line. We saw the same thing. So you're thing saying that Geordie hits the... him high here and... Forearm to the neck. And the Hurricane yeah. player comes You're not telling me that's side. high? Yeah, that's relative. That's and then high. The two Hurricanes players come in from the side, which is illegal. No, the ruck before. So that's, not, that's high shot, right, if we're going by the law. It's on the head. So, and the week before, the Hurricanes are 
uh, undone by a moment where just the TMO needs to have a look because we see the replays there and then. Right, we got that wrong. Penalty. We need a high performance review. <laughs> <laughs> we need Christina's opinion. Actually, what we need. Oh, right? yeah. I mean, if you keep going to the TMI, TMOs, you probably lose our, our spectators. I'll be going, oh, here's another five yeah, minutes yeah, to wait for the, re you know, the, the tape to, to go over and then people will switch yeah. channels and probably go over to the league. I think um, I get that the players have a justified um, appeal in trying to say we need consistency, but referees without them in a game, you know, like how are, how are we meant to function? And we all make mistakes. But if you're someone like Barrett who, you know, lives on the edge of, you know, breaking rules, he's, he's never far away from getting sanctioned. So I think there does need to be a bit of player responsibility. Yeah. Weaning out of those bad habits, you know, we know what the laws are. They're there in place for player welfare, for safety, and players need to adapt. They need to adjust tackle height. They need to adjust how they go into the clean-out, not with shoulders to black eyes, which I had one. Thanks to Danny for um, covering it up, by you the way. Great, you look great, Yeah, thank you. I, my club, my, my, I made a comeback to club on, on the weekend. <laughs> but just saying uh, the black eye incidents, I think players do need to also take responsibility. OK, well, we received a letter, actually, overnight here at the breakdown. I'm going to read it to you now. Um, who would, in all seriousness, give up a Friday or Saturday night to watch the current Super Rugby competition? <coughs> I would, especially yeah. if it was like this weekend. Yeah. How good. Whether at the game or watching on TV, the officiating is appalling. The, this incompetence radiates across the globe, so much so our referees are classed as second tier, and any future higher honour appointments are somewhat a long way off. Put them on notice that inept performances mean club officiating for weeks to come. That is from Michael Dawson. JK, I look at your face, I think you might have something to say on this. Yeah, no, I, I do disagree a wee bit. Um, we've got four referees on our world panel, which is the same amount as England, so we're one of the highest. Um, you know, Paul Williams and Ben O'Keefe are a couple of our top referees. And I personally believe that it's actually the law and the speed and the impact of the game now. So we're adding laws and adding interpretation. We've actually got to go through the rule book and see how many we can get rid of to simplify the game. I have people coming to watch the game, which I absolutely love, because I like looking at a ruck. But new people at the game go, what was that for? What was that for? What was that for? And you have to get them a red wine so they don't talk to you <laughs> asking you, what was that for, you know? And I, th I think, Christine, that's part of our problem. You know, rugby league, which I love as well, you know, the NRL changes things very quickly. They tried two refs for a couple of seasons. It didn't work. We've got to start taking our game and going, if the players are talking about this, it's an issue. You know, if our fans aren't turning up, it's an issue, and we should be looking at it. It's no one's fault. It's not Bryce Lawrence's fault. It's not, you know, it's, it's not anyone's fault. It's the game needs to look at itself. It does, and I wonder how much of it the players are needing to take a little bit of self-responsibility. There's been a lot of cards over the last two weeks particularly. We've seen a lot of 13 v 15 on the field. Um, Christina, what do you think? How much responsibility do the players need to take about keeping up to date with those rules? Because the reality is that's not changing. These are the rules. How quickly do they have to adapt? Yeah, I think I said it before, Laura, about there's, you know, refs are, are doing their best. You spoke about the interpretations and however many they have to do approaching the racket and, and the speed of the game. Um, I think players do need to take responsibility in a sense that they know the laws, they know the rules, they know about player welfare and if it means, you know, it's bad habits, especially when it gets to the later end of the game and fatigue starts to... It's to not spin. out again. Oh God, you haven't... What I was in that, that stogie? Sorry. What's... Just look at that. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. It like, looks like a pack and you, say can that. We, can we have a look again? Look. That is red card. That is red Barrett. Right? <laughs> but if you go behind Barrett, if we can see that again, is that possible, team? Um... If you look from behind an athlete and he is bent over like pack and save made here, <laughs> over here, bent, yeah. then, then mitigating circumstances... Look at that. He, look at his back. Look. He is in the middle. But the guy next to him was bent right over. So all we need to do in this case is use technology. Now, what is a mitigating factor? Look, I'm not the person to ask. Joey, yeah, you got some I, thoughts I, around unsure, mitigating factors? Unsure, but what I can say about <clears throat> these scenarios is... Sometimes in these scenarios, this, this is sometimes what you get coached, right? So in this instance, Hugh Renton's made the chop tackle. So he's gone low. So Josh Dixon's job and how it is coached is to hit around the ball. Obviously not hitting the head, but the, in, the intent is to sometimes hit with your shoulder and either bounce out into the line if you, if you don't win the contact. If you hit and win the contact, get up and go through the ruck. What we're seeing these guys do, and in Barrett's case, they're tucking the arm and going to just try 
absolutely annihilate a guy and then get back into the line. I think you And hoping that they don't get caught. I think back to your stick man uh, picture there, Sir JK, uh, the mitting gate effect, if, if he was low and if he was in the correct position, perhaps it's how they go into that contact. You know, if he's dropping, then that potentially could be a mitigating factor. Or well, maybe it, we just well, got to get rid of it as a tackle. So what? there'd be more offloads. Oh, better fun. Oh, more play. <laughs> Excellent. Less TMO. Less no, I'm serious. So play. I understand what you're saying, Joe, because when I was coaching, we used to coach second, second man in as hard as you can and wrap yep. the ball up, yep. right? So then you become, you become old, old mate Barrett here, right? The middle guy. But we're going to have to change the way we're doing that because obviously they're still coaching it and we're getting a red card every week. Well, Is this what fans want to see? What do fans want to see? Fast running rugby, not stoppages in play, go to oh, the play. Oh, I do think they still want to see some brutality. Oh, like, yeah, that's you need the footy, footy, right? You need the foot. You need that. But, but yeah, oh, you, player welfare is. Footy. Yeah, but you, a great tackle. Going... A great tackle over the ball when you're bent over properly oh, and you that, bash that, someone. Yeah. that is awesome. Coming up and hitting someone head is not what we so, need in our game. Clean full out, stop. No. So we we need to look at possibly coaches need to look at it. Possibly we need to look at at, at a different. Um, tackle law. So who cares if we don't wrap the ball up and some, they pass it to someone else? Do we care? No, probably not. You're right. Don't so if tackle law changes then, how do refs then go about... So if you've, if you've spent the last five years tackling in one way and then you've got to change it all of a sudden as a player, <laughs> and then you, how, how, do you, how do you referee that? Because then we're back to the same problem that we currently have, is that refs are not always getting it right. So if the players aren't always getting it right, where do we... Where's our middle ground? Well, normally what they've tried to do is um, punish you and keep you on the sidelines for three weeks, and normally that's been good enough, right? So what's the answer? I don't know. Maybe it's we need to go back to you can't replace the red card, which then the game goes, wow. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's you complicated. Yeah. Hey guys, it's my turn for Juicy Tails. And like everyone else, I keep mine in a box. So this is the first jersey I want to talk to you about. Um, this is important to me because this was my first ever start at our World Cup. Um, and it was against my sisters, the Manusina, Manusina team. Funny story is I was in tears throughout the whole um, national anthem, both Samoa and um, Black First national anthem, because Two weeks prior to that, I was having a drink with the Samalusina team and singing the national anthem, their national anthem as well. So, um, standing across from them in tears, but I thoroughly enjoyed the game. We smashed each other on the field, but then we became great buddies off the field. What does it mean to play uh, Samoa when you're from Samoa? Oh, it was, it was tough, um, very tough. Uh, but I'm a proud New Zealander and um, if it wasn't for New Zealand, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. And the, the girls understood that, um, you know, I play for black friends, but Samoa would always be close to heart. So, um, proud moment um, for my parents, but also a proud moment for myself. Okay, so underneath all these jerseys, special jerseys, is my most important jersey. And that is my club jersey, Auckland Marist. Um, very important to me, um, if it wasn't for this jersey, all these other jerseys wouldn't be possible. So I was seen in this jersey playing rugby, um, came in all different sizes, and I know the girls back in the day used to wear what the guys wore the next day, smelly jerseys, 
but I was fortunate to enough to be able to keep some of the jerseys in my time. And when you played club, you didn't always play hooker, did you? No. So I never got to play hooker towards the last 10 years of my career. So I played seven or I've covered from like one to 15. I even played fullback, believe it or not. <laughs> and I was really bad at it. Okay, so this is my first ever World Cup jersey, um, 2002. And this was in Barcelona. Um, who would have thought that a girl born in Samoa ends up in Barcelona, had to get my passport for it. Um, didn't know what Jet Lab was and was just an awe to be amongst all these um, great black friends. So cool that I spent three minutes in this jersey and that was my 2002 World Cup tour. Okay, so this is my 2010 World Cup um, jersey. Very special because it was the first time that I ever got on um, the final. So very, very special jersey and the fact that we won it too. And the bloody English gave us a silver medal as a gold medal. So this is my 2017 World Cup um, jersey, World in the final, um, pretty special. I was also captain on this jersey. We took it out on the 16th um, anniversary of my father's death. So special, we won it, um, won it for my dad, won it for my family, and these girls won it for their families. And so holding that World Cup um, up with this jersey just made it a whole heap special. That must have been a really emotional final for you. I was very emotional. Um, yeah, I just couldn't really think about it because um, I knew that we were, we were one team and I knew that my dad would be sh um, shining down on me on, on his anniversary, so very, very emotional. So thank you very much, guys. Um, thank you for sharing my juicy towels with me. Welcome back to The Breakdown. And we just saw there FIFA Amaseli uh, in Jersey Tales. And Christina, you played with her. She really is a living legend, isn't she? Oh, she sure is. I mean, it was special to see that, actually, and her share those, those stories about what the jerseys meant to her. And um, she's a real stalwart. What she's done, she played, what, 106, 106 caps for Auckland. She's won 15 titles for the Auckland Storm, 57 Black Fern um, caps, as well as four winning national titles. And not only that, She's still now involved in rugby by being a president of the Auckland Rugby um, uh, Board. So it's pretty special. And... And a Marist. And Marist. Woman. And Marist. And yeah. she's a detective in the police. So a strong, prominent wahine, Pacifica wahine, who's leading on and off the field and still involved. She tr truly is a, a living legend. Absolutely. Now, the big talking point off the field this week has been, of course, the Black Ferns review and subsequent departure of head coach Glenn Moore. Christina, I'm going to cut straight to it. You played under him. What was he like? Um, yeah, well, I'm grateful for my time in the Black Ferns and, um, you know, my, my oh, sorry debut was under his, his leadership and, and the relationship that we had was amicable. Um, but I think, and, and my comment is, I understand people's li livelihoods are affected by this, you know, so um, he, he was OK as a coach for me under, under his reign, but I think there's deeper issues that come about this review that I think uh, need to be highlighted. And they have been highlighted, and I think the fallout could potentially continue here. So Glenn has been accused of bullying and body shaming. Plenty more. Here is what he had to say to our friends at News Hub. I've never ever thought like that. Um, that's they're not my words. They're not my values. They're not my beliefs. So where did they come from? Well, I, I don't know, but. Um, 
what I, what I would say is, um, you know, uh, things like the skin fold tests and all those sorts of things are common practices in high performance sport. I don't agree with what's been said there around those allegations. And in particular, I think um, the completeness of some of them, how, you know, how words have been picked up and, and used in a certain way is uh, not what my understanding of, of those situations were. Um, and, you know, it lacked total context. So, um, you know, I, I've, I've come out and openly said I don't agree, I don't agree with that. I, I wouldn't call myself a scapegoat. I mean, I've looked through... Uh, I've looked through that document several times. I mean, my name's mentioned once or twice, but there's a lot of other things mentioned there that are uh, far more generalised or sit in other areas. So, look, I think it's a, I think it's a combination of things around where the game and the women's game has um, transformed from and where it's got to now. I think we've also got to remember that uh, up until a few months ago, the Black Ferns actually sat underneath community rugby. Um, and. You know, as things have uh, grown and transpired and, you know, semi-professional um, into professional now for, for some contracted players, you know, the infrastructures in that are not always in place. Heck of a review six months out from a World Cup for the Black Ferns at home. Um, JK, I'd like to get your thoughts on this because, I mean, how bad a coach can he have been? He coached them to a World Cup, um, they were World Rugby's team of the year. Some things must have been going well for him and the team. Oh, I worked with Glenn at the Blues, I was with him for two and a half years. Um, I found him open, honest, and I never saw any of those traits. I, f you know, I, th I thought he was a really good, up straight, good person who would tell you the truth. Um, but I think... I think the whole situation is we haven't had high... So, so I say this, paying people is not high performance or is it professionalism, right? Those two things are very, very different. What worries me is that, and you know better than me, why have we... Why has this happened? Like, we, were, we are world champions many times. Glenn has been a coach. So what, what's happened in the last 12 months? We got absolutely pumped in the Northern Hemisphere, and there was COVID, there's a whole lot of different reasons, but why haven't we been looking after the Black Ferns from a high performance point of view? Why haven't we? Maybe because the women in rugby, not women's rugby, may have been an afterport, may have been undervalued, under-resourced, and it's not until the other the countries in the other Northern Hemisphere are starting to get resourced and, and get paid and, and where it highlights. So the only sort of silver lining to this is like I said, there's, there's Takura, there's Glenn that have all been affected by, by the outcomes of, of this review. But I'm hoping that now it, it actually is about New Zealand rugby at that level, taking a look at what the, the recommendations, what the themes are within that re review and actually make a stand to, to say that they need to do better for women in rugby. And that's across all facets of, of rugby. So what needs to change? What needs to happen right now? Well, there's two things, right? You've got a World Cup that we need to defend the title for. That is held on our grounds, like in, in our country. So let's hope that we get in behind the Black Ferns and whoever the next coach is, is going to step into that head role. We need to still support our girls and that team and, and the management involved to win. But there also needs to be, at the ground level, it's sort of at the top level, at a political governance level, there needs to be actually a strategic plan for women in rugby. And that's not just players, that's management, that's volunteers volunteers, that's fans, that's refs, there needs to be some sort of plan in place that's equitable for, for women involved in the sport. And the two things could actually, you know, with the World Cup coming up, they could all work together. Uh, Joey, if all goes well. Yeah, well, I think well, <clears throat> what you're alluding to from the ground up, I think that's the benefit that um, we take for granted as, as, as probably young, young men. It's, it's in place, so it's in place with age grade teams, it's in place with academies, it's in place with schoolboy teams, New Zealand schoolboys teams. So these guys get exposed to high performance environments around selection, around all those things at a younger age and they build that resilience and they understand what needs to be done. They have those hard conversations. I, I, I believe we need to get down to that, that level so that these, these girls get, and, and women get exposed to that earlier so that they build that resilience. 
I totally agree. And I mean, we had coffee before we came came to Sky, and we and I asked you what was the pathway for boys. One of the recommendations, the theme was black ferns, high performance environment, and one of the recommendations is that there need there are some capability gaps in management due to a large part of historic lack of robust recruitment, yep. training, and support. So when you talk about um, secondaries, there is no second. I'm, I'm a coach of a secondary school at Manukura. There is no under 20s. There is no Ze New Zealand secondary school for girls. There is no super franchise that they can go into. You know, there's, they might start inviting the odd players, but there's none of that at that ground level to provide those pathways and opportunities. So if you're really going to get serious about investing in women in rugby, there needs that investment to actually bring about change. Uh, and look, one other thing that I'm really passionate about, we need to take mental health seriously. Yeah. We still don't take it seriously. And, you know, um, everyone's out of this has suffered. There were some people that would yeah. be really suffering. You can see, you know, in, in uh, Glenn's face and in his voice, he's upset. And I'm sure there's many people with them. So we've got to take a serious look at that and make sure people's mental health are protected. But I will repeat, we need pathways, right? So their high performance is under 16s, under 20s, yeah. And we tried to we we tried to bring in you know Super Rugby Alpic. It was awesome, right? But it was oh shit, what are we going to do? We lost, all right. This needs to be a pathway from when you because we are attracting some amazing athletes. If you're netball, you're worried. Yeah. You know? So so okay. So we work on pathways. Who do we get to replace them? Because you're six months out from a World Cup at home. You want to you know you want to win. Wayne the, Smith. Well, Wayne you know, Smith. obviously they've got the benefit, that, by the sounds of that, Wayne Smith's obviously in there till, till the World Cup campaign, which is just brilliant. The, you know, the, the scientist, the professor, he's in there. Graham Henry's going to be coming on as a, a selector, I understand. I think the logical uh, person would be Alan Bunting, I would have thought, who coached the uh, Chiefs Wahine side um, to, the, to the Maiden Super Rugby Ōpiki um, title, who's been so, so successful with the women's sevens campaigns, um, can develop a culture that obviously, we know our, our sevens women are just fantastic athletes. And I think him being involved, I mean, six months out, it's gonna go one of two ways, right? This can either galvanise these women together to create something really special and defend a title, or it could be an absolute train wreck, which I hope it's not going to be, but I believe if there's one man that can probably do it, it, it might be Alan Bunting that could be the guy. What about a woman, Sina? <laughs> yeah, good point. What about a woman? And no doubt that Alan Bunting has the, the respect from the players. He's He's been effective in that women's uh, Black Fern 7 space. But you've got Whitney Hanson, who's already been on a two-year intern, internship with the Black Ferns. You've got Victoria Grant, who's who's currently had to result in, in uh, coaching the Rotoiti men's team um, because there's no opportunities for her. Um, you've got Anna Richards. You've got Mal Bosman. There's a whole handful of, of, of females to, to select. Um, but I think New Zealand rugby balls it up from the get-go of Super Rugby Opiki. That would have been a prime opportunity to have a female head coach and have the support of Wesley Clark, who coached the Hurricanes Poa, Alan Bunting, who coached the um, Chiefs Manawa team. That comp only went for two and a half weeks. Why not put a woman at the head of that? Yeah, and but look what, look what the All Blacks have just done, right? A couple of things the All Blacks have just done. They've done their review and they've added three consultants. So I think the Black Ferns need to get the two best female coaches and stick them with Wayne Smith yep. tomorrow on the That's field. Right. right? And then Wayne will tell them it won't be gender biased. He'll say, you need to get better here and here. And if you don't, you're not good enough, whether you're male or female. So put the two best females, put the best person in the role right now and just get on with it and do it next week. The trouble is with the NZR sometimes, they procrastinate and it's not very transparent sometimes. So come out with a plan and we'll yep. go, OK, we got you. Good point there, JK. You talked about that support. You want coaches to be selected based on merit, right? But there also needs to be that development. There needs to be that education process. You need to pump resources in to, to females who want to coach, who want to be leading in that space. So, great idea. So have those key prominent coaches like Wayne Smith, what, 200 tests for the All Blacks in two centuries, wrap that support around the, the wahine who need to get involved in that coaching That's space. Right. Sorry, so, sorry jo Joey just said it could be a train wreck, right? And the interesting thing is the NZR did not... Um, get rid of Glenn, he decided to resign. So now you have a moment. You have a moment in time to go bang. Yeah. Huge. It's going to be a very big next few weeks, there is no doubt. It's time now for the trivia question, JK's favourite <laughs> moment of the show. Uh, you've got a few minutes when we go to the break to have a think about it. You do at home as well. OK, are you ready? Yes, please. You can take notes. 
Yes, please. Uh, how many New Zealand-born players are in the Ireland squad? Ireland? Squad. 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 The Six Nations squad. Easy. How many? Oh, cocky. Bit cocky. <laughs> right, OK, have a think. Uh, yeah. are, we, are we going yeah. now? Are we doing answers now? Should we do... No, do no wait. way you have to wait. Oh, yeah, I was yeah, just going to see. Yeah, right -o. Have a look at James Lowe scoring a few tries while these boys have a think, and Christina as well when we come back. The answer. Leinster looking for a fourth try on the evening. Sexton, oh, wonderful hands low. Can he ground it? That pass was a thing of beauty. Gibson Park, Maloney, it's all got a little bit scrappy as Leinster looked to put a bit of structure and a bit of class on it again. And it's ring rows, and that passes it straight while the referee says it's okay and low. Oh. Luke McGrath's in for Gibson Park as Ross Byrne, little show, little go and go low. Will James Low? Third try for James Low. Kicking behind, Low's after it. Not another. Oh yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. Fourth try for James Lowe on the night. Welcome back to The Breakdown. Now, it's the trivia question time here. JK, I, I think it's starting to grow on him. Am I, am I, is it starting to grow on you, the trivia question yet? No. No? OK, great. That's the attitude. OK, so today's trivia question. How many New Zealand-born players are in the current Island squad? I'm going to start with JK. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, I'd just like to say James Lowe, uh, Jamison Gibson Park, and Bundy Aki, although I don't know if he was born in New Zealand, I'm pretty sure he's New Zealand born, yeah, Samoan. Um, and I think there's someone I don't know. I just got this feeling there's someone I've missed on the bench. Well, I did say four and you've given me three, so yeah. that's, that's good. Um, Christina, do you want to have a crack? Oh, I don't really know or don't really care. No, just kidding. I <laughs> um, like it. You sound like JK. Bundy Aki, like uh, I'd say two. I have no idea, to be honest. Uh, oh, I'm going four and I, th I believe it's uh, McGrath. Maybe the the I think it's the first five or the fullback that comes on and kicks goals. Very good goal kicker. I believe. Just jump in. Okay, no, you're wrong. Um, oh, the fourth player four. is Joey Carberry. He was born in Dargaville, moved to Carberry. Ireland as an 11 year old. Oh, I'm not the number right. Made his debut against the All Blacks. He's a very in good In Chicago, goal kicker, 2016. And a great first name. So you got close, JK. You got real close. <laughs> Dargaville. <laughs> I'm not sure you are. The Highlanders, are the Highlanders actually suffering because people like <laughs> James Lowe are overseas now? Well, he'd make a huge difference, wouldn't he? We'd love to have You him. don't have any X Factor at would, the moment, eh? Well, he'd be great. Is that a personal oh, question or you mean in the team? No, I'm just coming back to his Easter. <coughs> oh, you're coming back to the Easter. <laughs> 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 it's all, it's all <laughs> gone growing <laughs> up here. <laughs> um, uh, Joey, now it's a big moment for you. It is oh. a really big moment. Oh, yes. um, it's time for Wheelers way too early. All Blacks 15. <laughs> Joey, talk And it, and talk it is way through. too early. It way, is, way it too is early. way too early. But I am excited. Fozzie gave me a call and said, I want you to name a way too early um, <laughs> All Blacks Form 15. And I, I have based this off form and I've taken 
and out um, guys that are injured. So remember that when you're looking at the side please at home. But Ethan <laughs> DeGroote gets the nod at loosehead prop. And this is worrying because uh, Joe Moody went down on the weekend and I'm seriously concerned about our depth at, at loosehead prop at the moment. Uh, Samasoni Takiaho has been absolutely outstanding for the Chiefs. Or for Tonga Fussy, uh, outstanding on the weekend as well. Scott Barrett, well, he might be going for a skate for a long, long time because uh, he's had form with the with the shoulder, so I don't know if he will uh, be in the side or not. To be via, obviously. Uh, I've gone, um, obviously, there's a bit of a theme here with, as you'll see later on, but a couple of Marco boys, Ethan Blackadder. Uh, Sam Kane gets the nod at captain. Um, maybe controversial for some, but I think his form has been exceptional for the Chiefs, and obviously, I, I believe our best skipper, Artie, just has to be in the side, so put him at eight. <coughs> uh, Aaron Smith. Probably not at the top of his form, and he'll be the first to admit that, but he's world-class, and I just don't think we can have an all-back side without Aaron Smith um, running the cutter. Bowden Barrett gets the nod at 10 just because of his performance against the, uh, the Crusaders, um, against Richie Mwanga. It was a, it was a coin toss uh, for um, the Blues uh, left-winger Caleb Clark and Leicester Whainanuku, and Leicester won that, and obviously, being a Tasman lad, it was a weighted coin. The big talking point, Roger Tuovasa Sheik, have you seen something we haven't? <laughs> yeah, I have. So did, One game. Excuse me, did you what just say in form? Who? Yeah. You said this is your in form side. Roger Tuavasa Sheck <laughs> has not played for five weeks, well, Joey. Might have been, what are you yeah, thinking? No, he, did. he came off the bench. You know, I just loved his performance off the bench for 20 minutes. <laughs> no, I just, I think that this guy is going to bring something really, really different that we, we haven't seen probably since Sunny. Before. And last time you saw Tupavai play lock? Uh, <laughs> well, you can what play six, to... but we're, we're so short on locks. We're losing. We're what lost. about Lord? Lord's on the bench, mate. Lord's on the bench, but this guy, JK. Locks, I, I think, oh, no, I, I'm not uh, disagreeing create, with you. Creating, for me, we need. Uh, I, I love David Averley, obviously, a ta another Tasman lad. Yeah. You know, I put him in there every day. Of the I think week, there's a little bit of bias. But I just think Roger and his ability to, to break the line like he does, keep the ball alive, that, that's what this all black side needs. Uh, this is my bench. I've just gone for power uh, on the bench. Obviously, Dalton, with his performance on the weekend, unlucky not to get the nod. Finlay Christie, some may say controversial, uh, but a, a great Tasman um, lad who's playing some outstanding footy for the Blues at the moment. And Caleb Clark again, um, he's been... Oh, is he Top from Tasman? He hasn't, well, he hadn't played for 18 months and he's I thought he uh, might not be from injured Tasman. at the he's su suspended. So you said Tasman 14 times. <laughs> He's from well, this could be you a said Tasman, he's from... Like, if I said that in the Blues... This could be a Tasman 415. It could be a Tasman 415. I don't know. But no. I, I don't know. What do you reckon? What is that, what would Joey? You Someone told me you invented that too. What oh, is I that? I can't claim that. Andrew Goodman claimed that. But it's better than Jonathan Poff's one, that he, <laughs> he just put the fin up and tried to do the way. I think the interesting thing about talking about the All Blacks right now is I do think there's some really, really interesting situations because, for me, Rico Ioane, with the amount... And Todd Lena Brown out... You know, there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of injuries. Um, Retallick and, and Whitelock, they'll be back. But we need 18 tests to go. I say that every week on the breakdown. 18 tests to go. We need to start thinking about combinations. And we were talking about combinations before. You know, when you get used to a player. We need to start saying, what is our final team? And if we can get it on the field, get it on the field. Christina, what do you think? Oh, I think, well, we look at the card situation, you named three All Blacks <laughs> in there that well, have been Admittedly, have I didn't have to send that through to Jim, our producer, oh, okay, on, a, okay. on a Thursday. So there's a bit of bias there. I get what you're saying about Roger. He's going back to league next next year anyway, so maybe... Oh, is he? What, do you know something we don't know? Oh, Hang on. Oh, no, definitely not. Jake, I thought definitely you were not. in the no hit. No, once he gets in that, um, that, that blue side alongside Bowden Barrett, I think we're going to see his development just go through the roof, his understanding of the game, the pitches he's going to see, because... He he hasn't, he hasn't played in a long, long time, 15s, and we saw the promise for me, of developing that other stuff. For me, he is Sonny Bill Williams. For me, he's come into our game. I think he's got X Factor, and I would, and I wouldn't say this, don't get me wrong, people, I would never say this about the all-black jersey, but I would put him in straight away, just because we've only got 18 tests to go. I've seen enough in his two games, with his feet especially, right? So that he was will a get brilliant, us over selection the from, from brilliant selection from... Brilliant selection, thanks, Joe. And you didn't mention that he was from Tasman, either. <laughs> if you're from well, Tasman, well, you're well, in Joey's side. Well, um, there's always a spot available for you in Tasman, mate. <laughs> Goodness gracious me. Christina, what do you think? Do you think he's got X Factor? 
Oh, he certainly has X Factor. Um, yeah, twinkle toes. I mean, you've only seen him in a couple of games, but yeah, he'd be a good addition to that midfield. But I, I actually think about the bolters that have been missed off your li list, like Peter Gus Suakula. He's been in form at, at number eight. Uh, Fletcher Newell, Kurt Eklund. I noticed you didn't name uh, Cody Taylor in that in that starting lineup. But what about some bolters who, who might actually be able to get on that tour? I, I just don't think we can. I, I just don't. Not as far out. I, 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 I think we're stuff. way too close to the World Cup to actually start adding too many. I think if there's a Nihil Scudder, right, and he's just outstanding, yeah. But like, nah. What do you go on the left wing, J.K.? Because you've got Caleb, Caleb Clark, who's been. You go, Caleb. You, we could talk about this all day, but we've still got a whole lot of rugby to play no, before we right pick on. that All Black squad. So thank you guys so very Eight much for your time today. Joey, Christina, superb. JK, enjoy that egg. Thank that. you so much for joining so us yours, here Joe. on The Breakdown. Bombas. Happy, happy Easter. We'll see you next week. When the devil calls, I'm going to ride that train. Well, they go ahead. Bowden Barrett changes everything with a great break up the middle.